tick tock goes the clock, tick tock, tick tock. The end of the world as we know it is surely coming, but before it does, it's time for a few stories. Now those of you that drop by regularly will know that in the lead up to Halloween I'm doing a series of anthology videos on a Wednesday for you, and this week I have three more stories, all around the theme of the apocalypse. Three more from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you, and three more brilliant ones indeed this evening. Well, my dear friends, I think you know what time it is. It's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. Late last year, on a night where the air was as cold as it was clear, a black leather-bound notepad fell through a hole that existed only for the tiniest moment. The rip in time produced an explosion that smashed windows and set off car alarms. An entire street woke up at 3 a.m. to the disturbance. The police arrived in minutes and were given nothing other than the worn leather book found by a small boy in his pajamas. It took months and the book was thumbed by many hands until, eventually, its genius was discovered, tested and proven. The book now resides in the London Science Museum and is deemed one of the most valuable scientific texts ever to have been discovered. This is what it reads. I think I am the last human alive. This place I'm in is, in many ways, a paradise. Although the sign into town still stands, there's not a lot else that does. I came here because I can remember how Sakendega Lake looks so beautiful in the sunset. I found a small rowing boat a couple of years ago that had held together for over tens of years in its storage shed, so I spend most of my days fishing out on the water. This place has none of the horrors I've come across, but also none of the people I love. No people at all, in fact. It's just me this book and my machine. And I'm ready now. Let me tell you how I got here. My name is Julian Brown. I live at 71 O'Neill Street, Kingston, New York. And as far as I know, I'm the world's first and only time traveler. I suppose I have a new title now as well. I'm the last human to ever live on planet Earth. I would try and put this nearer to my home back south, but it's too far for me now. I just hope it lands in good hands. In the year 2026, I will finalize the working version of my time machine. The time hopping had become a reality when I realized that it is only possible to travel forwards in time. Attempting to travel backwards would immediately change history, and then the future that develops is different to the one in which the traveler leaves thereby making it impossible for them to ever have left in the first place. As it turns out, the butterfly effect has profound complications when it comes to time travel. My first time jump took me forward one week. <laughs> as you'd expect, life was the exact same as it was when I left, except that my work had let me go. I didn't mind much. The discovery I'd made was incomprehensibly valuable. So, a week went by in the blink of an eye. I took a walk around the neighborhood, making sure everything was in working order, both for me and the world itself. Once I was happy that there were no complications, I took the machine to the little garden at the back of my house. Another blink of the eye, and six months had passed. I remember the grass from the garden lapping at my ankles. It was long and unkempt from half a year of not being cut. I went into the house, and my unclean plates on the side had grown considerable amounts of mold. I took my phone out of my pocket and found hundreds of emails, missed calls and texts displayed on the screen. I called my poor, seventy-year-old mum, and she cried. I went straight over and explained where I'd been. I couldn't believe I hadn't bothered to think about her. 
She tried to talk me out of my plans, but by this point it was too late. I had to go further. I had to see what was next for us all. She promised me she would hide my work and sell my home. Oh, looking back, I wish I'd listened. I wrote a will, say goodbye to my family and what few friends I had. It was profound. I felt as though I was purging myself of the world I'd lived in for my entire life. In six months, my mother could claim on my life insurance policy. Next, I jumped 30 years. My phone no longer worked. I went to the bank, and 23 years ago a couple of hundred thousand dollars had entered my account. My mother's will, it turned out. The interest had accrued to over half a million, and so I withdrew as much as I could and brought all of the latest tech. The newest things were holographic lenses that project everything over your vision, from news stories and weather to people's moods and social network profiles. They had all manner of uses. The war in Syria had ended. The government had taken control and militants were extremely rare. Russia had seized total control of Ukraine. Things were easy then. Cars were quiet, electric, and they drove themselves. Drones delivered things. People worked fewer hours and seemed, for the most part, to be happy. I spent two months in the utopia of the 2050s. When you get there, make the most of it. I just hope I haven't changed it too much by writing this. Eventually... I removed my lenses and discarded my phone, then jumped another thirty years. People I'd left as babies on my first time jump were now older than me. The town was deathly quiet. I wandered through a street paved with ransacked shops, burned vehicles and broken windows. I shouted for someone, for anyone, but no one came. After a while, a beaten up electric van drove up the street. The silver paint was scratched and the walls were dented, but it was still moving. A red light on the top of the bus pinged to green, and it came to a halt by an old bus stop. Without really thinking, I ran to the van and hopped in. With no driver, the whole of the inside of the shuttle was made for passengers, so I sat at the front. The door shuffled shut awkwardly, and then the van began its journey out of the town stopping at a few more empty bus stops along the way. The voice on the bus was repeating itself. Emergency shelter bus. Please keep hold of all your belongings and make way for other passengers. I eventually arrived, alone, at a massive metal wall built into the side of a hill I now know was near Woodstock. The van put itself on charge as I walked up, to a door built into the bottom corner of the wall and pressed my finger against the button beneath the screen. I called, Hello, into the speaker, and waited for a while until I got a response. I later found out that they'd stopped monitoring the outside of the shelter years before I arrived, so it took some scrambling to get someone to the microphone on the inside. I exchanged words with the voice coming from the shelter, and after repeating myself a few times, they hesitantly let me in. Russia had made a move beyond Ukraine and beyond subtle threats. Their bombs had not come from the air, but from the sea, and they'd not really been bombs at all. Anyone near the coast had no chance of avoiding the attack. They, along with a large percentage of the world, had come to be known as hounds. The hounds were people that had been infected by a chemical attack that had simply been able to change the chemistry in their brains. They'd been left in a constant fight-or-flight mode and had lost the ability to converse or think logically. This had resulted in rioting and stealing and, eventually, a total breakdown in the economy. The chemical attack was passed by infection and before long these massive shelters had been constructed all across the world. In even less time, they were populated. I stayed at the shelter for a few days. People saw hope in me. 
but there was really nothing I could do. By 2086, we were no longer advancing. Survival was the prime target now. I went out for, on a couple of excursions for vital supplies with a small group. The virus was only passed through bodily fluids, so as long as we stayed away from the hounds, we should have been fine. As we were exploring around a nearby town, we heard screams from the half-humans. We jumped into a nearby diner and took up defense behind the food counter. We were silent, but they found us anyway. From all around us, the hounds appeared from street corners and roofs. I heard heavy footsteps above my head. Men, women, and children came for us. Their eyes locked on us all as the bodies outside began to shrink in on our defense, like the closing of a drawstring bag. They carried weapons. It was mostly just scavenged weaponry, metal poles and bats and hammers. As the first hound got to the glass-fronted door of the diner, one of us fired. It hit the small boy in the center of his forehead, and he fell to the floor in an instant. The others trampled over him, taking bullets and falling themselves. The others told me to go, and they didn't mean go back to the shelter. I wasn't armed, and in their own words, I was a hindrance in the current situation. I went into the back room, pulled the little machine out of my pocket, and set it for a week. When I reopened the door, the floor was slick with blood. Flies swarmed around the bodies by the doors, and also on the bodies of my search party members. A lot of their innards had been pulled out and feasted on, but now had dried and was stuck on the floor. I slowly snuck around my newly made friends' corpses and outside into the fresh air. I didn't want to go back to the shelter. I walked up to a small forest above the town and skipped forward fifty years. In 2136, the town was the same as fifty years before. The buildings were being overtaken by the world around it. Tall grass was growing in the streets and ivy clung to any surface it could climb. There were no paths forged out of the foliage. I didn't explore. Another fifty years, another growth spurt from the floor. The building had fallen down, probably weakened from the plants splitting any cracks wider with their roots. Animals were in abundance. I could barely hear myself think over the bird call. Deers grazed on the grass beneath the traffic lights. I hop forward one final fifty years, and this is where I am now. I've lived a fantastic life over the last five years in these times. I built myself a home within one of the once decrepit buildings in the town. It has a great view of the lake at sunset. I hunted deer, rabbit, and boar. I found books to occupy myself with over the years. But, well, I'm done now. I want to travel further, to see what's next. But, I cannot. I can't risk not being able to send this book back to you all. And the second I do, this will all cease to exist. In the next few pages are a few things. The proof of who I am and all of my schematics for time travel. I beg you to use this information wisely. For now, so long. Julian Brown, May 4, 2236. I don't really remember when it all happened, when they came. I think about seven years ago. Oh, who cares? The only thing that matters to me now is what they took from me. The Bible speaks of Jesus descending from the heavens along with thousands of angels and bringing forth the apocalypse. <laughs> Something like that happened. A religious person might have argued that they were indeed angels descending from the heavens. Let me tell you, they were no angels. 
They did descend from the skies like angels, though. At first, they took everyone. Men, women, children, even cats and dogs. They would simply come down and disappear, along with a group of people who also vanished with no trace of them ever being there. The numbers of the Taken grew with every time they returned. They took men and women and children indiscriminately. However, everyone noticed. They started suddenly taking only the women and the girls. And the men couldn't do anything. The government couldn't do anything. They simply came, took the females and disappeared. They eventually came for my family. My wife, Josephine. My two girls, Sandra and Leah. They simply emerged into being on our front lawn one summer day. I looked back at my wife, who stood behind me. She must have seen the look on my face, because her face grew pale, matching that of my own. Run! I hardly managed to scream, as the being opened the barricaded door like a child tearing off a page from a book. There was too much light. I couldn't see at first, but as my eyes adjusted to the light, I saw a humanoid silhouette emerge amongst the brightness. No, I muttered. No, 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 no. It simply walked past me. I don't think it even turned to look at me. It was headed for the basement. I found my footing and headed straight for the kitchen, which also contained my weapons. I grabbed a gun, and making sure it was loaded, followed the light that was now diminishing towards the basement. I ran and stood behind it, and unloaded my gun straight at it. I emptied a whole mag at this being, and oh, there were no signs of impact. No holes riddled the wall, either. It was as if this thing just absorbed my bullets into nothing. I used the gun as a melee weapon and smashed the weapon right at its head. It didn't even seem to register that, as it ripped open the basement door and went straight inside the basement. I followed it. I saw my wife and children walking willingly towards it, their eyes filled with a strange expression of reverence and awe. That was it. An even brighter light flashed, and when I regained my vision, they were gone. I thought long and hard about what had happened. I grew angry. Then the anger left me, and I felt grief. And then I accepted it. They were gone. I roamed the streets aimlessly. I saw men kill themselves, kill each other, and generally just die. One night, as I lay under a bridge, thinking about what to do next, a man jumped off it causing a splash that snapped me back from my thoughts. I didn't even care to go and try and help him. He wanted it, and we were all finished anyway. Everyone just walked around like zombies, aimlessly roaming the streets. I went back to my house and fell asleep. This went on for days. I didn't even know how long. People grew desperate. Men assaulted other men. They tried to kill one another and killed themselves. And then they just stopped. All the havoc equaled nothing at the end of the day. I never left the house. For some people, life went on. They moved on and lived their lives, even though it was a hopeless one. Then, one day, they returned. No. Oh. Not the beings. I watched as a man looked up to the sound of a woman. I watched as he got up and ran to her. I then watched as the man was turned to dust and the woman just disappeared. Honey! A voice echoed in the house. I shot up and instantly turned around and ran out of the room. Running down the stairs, I found myself face to face with my family standing at the edge of the stairs, looking up in smiles that welcomed me. Honey, I'm home, Josephine said. Daddy, cried Leia. I took a step forward towards them. 
Daddy, we missed you so much, Sandra spoke. I paused. There was something about the way she'd said it. Daddy, come to us, said Leia. I looked at Sandra. Daddy. She reached out her arms as if to welcome me with a hug. Daddy. I realized what was wrong. They had been perfectly made. They sounded like them and looked and acted like them, but... Daddy. Oh, no. Sandra never calls me Daddy. I tried to make her call me that for so long. Dad or Papa, or whatever she wants to address me as. And she only called me Chris. You're not them, I said. You're not them. I screamed as I turned around and headed towards my room. I climbed out of the window and down to the lawn. I ran like I'd never run before. The streets were empty, littered with sand and dust. They didn't follow me. They didn't morph into monsters and rip me apart. No, I never saw them again. Well, that's my story anyway. I've been living like a scavenger, surviving on whatever seems edible. <laughs> it's a surprise I'm not dead of food poisoning yet. I know. Well, I know. If anyone finds this, I know nobody will. Please, just kill yourself. There is no hope. I don't know who those beings were and why they did this to us. But the Bible was right about one thing, though. The men descending from the skies brought about the end of days. I think I need a drink. A siren screams. All throughout the sun-bleached walls of a farm town by a great American lake, that scream ricocheted. The divine echo of Air Raid Awareness Day had been filled with so much energy that it made church bells ring. It was like a wedding. Everyone was excited. The townspeople prayed under mattresses in their cellars, as the breath of the apocalypse spilled onto unattended rose gardens in the early morning. General stores left unguarded, with the doors open. White burlap sacks of sugar, free for the taking. Fields devoid of workers. Schools with sun rays breaking in through their windows. A snapshot of when God stopped looking. Now, at 6.02 a.m., when all were expecting a sword to be thrown down from the sky that was certain to end every single life. A bird the size of several commercial buses swooped from on high to land upon the tower of that church bell. She was quiet. She was large enough to cast a shadow a mile toward the west. She was a statue of a chimera made of every avian breed to ever symbolize an omen. In an hour's time, when every man and woman had made peace with the Holy Trinity or damned the name of the Spirit for stealing his children in the cruel execution that appeared imminent, the townsfolk emerged. The siren stopped, and from underground and from the other areas they'd fled to, the first few, brave enough to let curiosity conquer fear, found the vacant street. A woman in a long blue dress, with thin black hair, let wind sweep through her legs as she stood between tall stalks of wheat. In her blue eyes, the image of that great beast reflected purely. In widening white orbs, set in a fearful face, those sapphires saw the feathers resting on the tallest building. She was quiet. She was a dark mass that brought the women to begin kneeling. Inside the eclipse in the law office where he worked, Yorick pressed his back to the wall beside the window. From that second story, 
He'd peered at the shade that was now inside the hole of Market Street. His gaze drifted about the muted colours of the other enterprises before gravity brought them parallel to the newest wonder of the world. His hand on the suit vest, his heart beating like a drum through his breast, his bones feeling shallow as his skin quivered. Courageously, without any cause or plan, after hundreds of minutes that lasted eternities, spent in frightful meditation that had brought no answers, Yorick stepped out into the street. The pavement was the carpet which draped down the steps before a royal throne. Knees buckling like a newborn in approach to the abomination that sat atop God's home. The lawyer's mouth opened in a semi-fugue state in a whispered question that escaped him. Focusing on the cross beside the anomaly, he asked, Would you explain this? She opened her beak and revealed human-shaped teeth. She spoke in a new language of down-pitched tweets. Loud enough to rattle the bricks, yet in his mind the words registered as if it were just a whisper. It felt like water was draining from his ears. Yorick lifted his hand to the side of his neck. The bird whistled more alien words as red liquid set into the palm Yorick held in front of himself. A bloody snood dangled above its massive mouth. A long, muscled tongue stretched out of an evil throat. A grotesque mockery. As wings spread and the air around him began to shimmer, a mostly honest man looked up at this dragon. You'd ask me to lie, to barter with you, in response the evil roared. In that roar, the miles around them became empty of air. Yorick's vision spilled over into black as the beat of his insides became the only vibration his eardrums would find. As a hostage offered gold, in a history that will be only a folktale ever after. In a town with no roads leading outward, a secret was kept. A dark deal accepted. The first of a thousand heroes, said the voice of a young mother. And a thick tome of fantastic tales shut its pages over her lap. That's enough for tonight. Sweet dreams, my lovely and the click of a lamp. Well, another lovely collection of stories there for you. Hope you enjoyed those. Back again next Wednesday with, well, I hope, another collection of stories <laughs> if I get my act together and get a bit of reading done. So, thank you once again to all those who shared the stories with me. If you've got a story that you think I might be good at reading, then why not share it with me? Links in the video description below. Well, that's Wednesday. We've made it through hump day. Weekend will be on us soon. So, hope I'll see you all again on Friday. I'll be here. I hope you'll join me. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?